Thank you, Jonathan. We will have now Jed Grant, and in the end, both will comment uh, one slide, which we think should be your takeaways. Perfect. Jed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to speak about um, how smart data will change our world. It's a step beyond big data in the evolution towards intelligence. As Jonathan said, uh, we haven't been able to replace the cognitive aspect of, of thinking with machines yet, but we are moving in that direction. And that's sort of the gist of, of what I'm going to show you. I'll show you some, some first some background and ideas of how we've moved, and then use cases of where we are today. Uh, these are actual real use cases. And then um, give you a takeaway on, on maybe some of the things we should think about because we're moving very, very quickly. Um, so where are we coming from first? If you look at it, as, as Jonathan said very clearly, volume and velocity, but it's much more than that is, is a, a big data. But what we're really looking for is veracity and value. We're looking for intelligence. We're looking for conclusions. We want to take all of this information and we want to have intelligence from it so that we can make the right decision to do the right thing. And in any industry, that is exactly where we're headed with this technology. It is going to enable us to better serve our customers to create not only number one shows, but number one investment products. Um, so we need to get there. But how far can we automate that process is the real question today. And I believe that we've, we're passing through a number of ages, and Moore's Law applies to our ages as well. And this means things are going faster. So if you have felt like things are going faster, I believe that it, your perception is not wrong. That is actually what's happening. The amount of data is exponentially growing. And if you look at the length of these ages from the pre-industrial to the industrial to the information age to the digital age where we, we had workflow mania and the idea was to get rid of paper and put everything into our, into our you know, Adobe forms and whatnot, we are now passing into the intelligent age where we're actually asking some of the machines to do some of the thinking and the concluding that we have done in the past. And this is a very interesting time as it goes faster because it may end up with a lot of the enlightenment that we've always projected technology would bring us, the leisure time, the improvement in quality of life, but it also could end up with Skynet, and we don't want that. So we need to think about where we take the tech as we move forward. So if you look at where we get our benefits, our productivity, it's always been power sources and industrialization up until the last 20 years that have driven that productivity. But always we've had people. So we get better machines, we get better power, but we've always had a person there to supervise, to drive the machine, to make the conclusions, to make sure that things were working. It always still required a human mind in order to get the job done. And if you look at the increases, they are massive by industrial, but they are minute compared to the way our data is increasing today. You have factors of 40 from the power loom, 50 from the cotton gin, um, the steel mill was 15 times faster. All of these were the human beings still able to think at the speed of the way the progress was going. And then we came with robotics and digital reproduction, which enabled us to have the first light touch processes. So human beings were no longer, a brain was no longer required to drive each step of the process. We just had to provide quality assurance, supervision. One man could look over this entire factory floor and verify that everything was going right. So this is a very light touch conclusion in the process. And then the paperless automation allowed us to create some systems that were entirely no touch with um, some tight constraints. So the, the forms had to be done in certain ways. The data had to meet certain qualifications. But you could actually have a complete process, self-service uh, process for an end customer that required no human at the other end. We see these today all the time. E-banking is a common, common one. There's nobody pushing a button to say, yes, we're going to do that transfer. If it meets the criteria, it will just happen. And now we're at the intelligence age where we can actually ask the machines to do some of that thinking for us. So we can solve inhuman problems. We can actually take the technology that we have today because the processing power and the data management, the capacity of memory is so great that we can actually apply it to problems that you cannot solve with people anymore. No matter how many people you throw at the problem, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. 
because you cannot get the people to coordinate, to think the same. They don't have telepathy. It can't be done. I'll show you three use cases now. The first one is the parking lot spy. It's a, a very simple and one of the earliest uh, big data applications that I came across that was really stunning in how clever and simple it was. The people hound, another, if anyone has used sound hound to, uh, to check out music, you can do the same thing with people. And I'll talk a bit about KYC3 and the analysts that we have automated. At the heart of KYC3, what we've done is automated the job of a junior intelligence analyst. So we've automated that conclusion process in order to produce intelligence. So if you want to know your customer supermarket style with the parking lot spy, you want to know who is coming into your parking lot, who is coming into your shopping center. You want to know the profile of that person. You want to know everything about them so that you can serve them and sell them as much as possible. How can you do that? You put in place a loyalty program, you put in place cameras on the parking lot entrance and exit, and you put license plate readers that can read the text of the license plate. You can also detect other things. You build data from this. You have the shopping records of every person with that card. You have all the enter and exit records of the cars. You have the model to make. You have whether it was a male or female driving the car, this type of thing. So you can see all of this information about these two different sets of data that you get every single day piling up and getting bigger and bigger. And what you have is the frequency, which is a temporal key. So using the timing in this data, you can cross-reference the data and come up with a 100% accurate projection of who is coming in your parking lot based on when they came in last time. So if you have a Mrs. Smith who comes in on Monday and Thursday, twice a week, you know she buys cookies, she's 55, she lives 10 kilometers away, that's your shopper program. You know there's an AH2019 license plate that's a Mercedes S-Class with a female driver that comes in Monday and Thursday as well. With enough data in these two sets, you can match it and prove that she is indeed the person driving that car, and you know when she's going to be in next week, and you know what she's going to buy. So Monday at 10 a.m., Mrs. Smith and 27 other people come in, quick, stock the cookies, and we can adjust the pricing because we have digital price tags now on the shelves. So we can maximize our profit. If you look at the people hound, this is something I presented in 2010. I was a keynote speaker at uh, Intelligence Support Systems Conference in Bethesda, Maryland. And this, at that time, was uh, hypothetical. It was technically possible, but I didn't know of any case where it had been done. I now know it has been done. Um, and it is basically sound hound for the crowd around you. So if you look at how this is possible, in 1997, the Defense Department's state-of-the-art facial recognition software still had a 0.54 error rate. That's a false positive, again, false reject against 1,000 uh, false accepts. And in 2000, there were about 100 billion photos taken on the planet, and only a very small percentage of those were digital. By 2010, we've increased the accuracy of facial recognition in open source software almost 1,000 fold, and we have 2.5 billion photos with faces tagged in them being uploaded to Facebook every month. If you put those together, you have what you need to do the job. So the first step is to capture a facial image. You just need a picture of a person. Once you have that, you farm out the work. And it can be done on mobile devices. If you had an app connected to Google Glass or even using the phone, you can farm that out to all the mobiles running that app in the area. They compare the face that you've taken with all the faces in the Facebook friends of the individuals that are in the area and you come back and group that back to the central machine, takes the highest probability hits, and you can then determine who you're looking at. It's very feasible to do. And it's so easy to do now uh, that you just need Facebook. You need standard open source MapReduce architecture that can do that. And you've got your facial Iron Man style scanner that can let you know who's in front of you without asking a single question. In 2014, Carnegie Mellon University did it. A group of students did this. 
They did it in just a few weeks with a phone app. They didn't use any fancy glasses, but they were able to build an application that would detect in real time, and they used some other databases as well that they added in so that they could get birth dates, social security numbers, as you see up there, and other information about the people that they were looking at. So you just point the phone at a face, and you know who it is in real time. And that's done by students as a class project now. If I look at KYC3, as I mentioned before, we've automated the job of a junior analyst. So we wanted to be able to process lots of unstructured text and to have the result, the intelligence. So we read all the news all the time. We pull in 55,000 different news sources in 22 languages. We have company documents from several jurisdictions. We hit all of the official sanction and watch lists of the FMA and FATF countries. We pull all this data in all the time, near real time, and process it. That's a big task. We have sources in Europe, in Africa, Asia, North America. The darker the country, the more data we get from it. South America. And to process all that, you need this. That's not BGL, that's UBS in the picture. <laughs> so you would need this old-fashioned room full of people to do all this reading and to read all this. What we've done is taken this room and we put it in four square meters, in two racks, three racks, in a data center. And you can replace all of these junior analysts who are Googling and reading and figuring out who, what, when, and where. And the way we do it, in very simplistic, this clicker doesn't really work. The way we do it is, to, it's a new approach. So by using machines to do the reading, if you look at the old-fashioned way that people are doing diligence, they are using rooms like that. One of those companies actually advertises that they spend 750,000 man hours. They use this as marketing, that they spend 750,000 man hours to read and curate the database that you pay for. Who wants to pay for 750,000 people hours of real people that need salaries and social security and all of that? when we have a cluster that can do 131 million man hours of reading in the same time period. So it's a, it's a different game. And we get finished intelligence. We don't just curate a database. And how we do it is pulling all of that information in as quickly as we can, indexing it, but processing it with a machine learning system that we've trained to read this text. And we've trained it to do two things. We've trained it to identify the context of what that text is about, politics, crime, health, entertainment, sports, corruption, et cetera. And we've trained it to, inside the text, recognize who, what, when, and where, and the relationships amongst them. As soon as you have this, you can say that this person is a parent with this strength in this context, and these are the things they're related to, these companies, these addresses, these other people. You have automated an intelligence analyst. But if you think about this compared to the big room of, of people, the difference is actually that you couldn't do this with people because our brain knows everything that it has read and everything that it has indexed. So you'd need to have a room full of telepathic people who each have each other's memory in order to come up with the same result. So the big picture is you get millions and millions of mentions. You have a graph that is the world, potentially, every single human being, every single company, every single address can be represented, ultimately, in that structure. Here you see, uh, it's quite timely, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, even though this slide is very old. Uh, and the company, American Vantage Companies, which we've probably never heard of, most people, unless you're in the movie business, this is the company that produced Mr. and Mrs. Smith, where they met. Isn't that ironic? And if you look at what you can do with that data is you can unify the facts. You have the intelligence that can cut across your enterprise and you have this army of analysts that produce intelligence that allow you to make the conclusions you need to do. And so that your front office and your back office have the same facts, you can all agree on it. You don't look at siloed data sets the way it's happening in traditional uh, industry today. But we're not there yet, so we're not automating everything. We can't decide, we can't have cognitive systems that decide many things yet. Um, and we have to think very carefully about it because machines are not intelligent. They are dumb. They just do what we tell them to do. 
even though we build very, very complicated instruction sets, they are stupid. They don't have feelings or intuition, which ours are often wrong. When you're climbing on a climbing wall and you're roped in, you still get the jitters, even though you know you can't fall and die. But they're often right, and gut feelings are very important in human interaction, and we can't delegate that to machines. If you look at where some of this is going, I mean, the ultimate thing is do we put the machine in charge of the weapon on the drone? And there is a debate actually happening about this. I mean, should a machine be allowed to take a human life? And that question has been answered. It's happened already. In, in May of this year, a Tesla crashed because it misunderstood that a truck wasn't the sky and it killed the driver. It just happened again in China with another Tesla on autopilot. So we have let machine learning and machine algorithms kill those two people already. Um, but we fortunately haven't put guns on drones with machines deciding who to shoot. We still let humans make those mistakes. What does it mean for banking? All the way back in 1994, Bill Gates said banking is necessary, but banks are not. I think he hit the nail on the head. He was thinking about paperless automation and workflow, probably. Um, but an institutional bank in that monolithic sense is something that needs to transform itself. It needs to change. And banking service is what needs to be delivered. So, th And that is sort of what fintech, much of fintech is doing to the banking industry. It might be scary from the inside for some of you who are, are working in banks. Uh, but the premise of a lot of fintech, especially in the United States, is unbundling the bank and providing excellent service on a very specific uh, vertical or niche there. So if the banks can digitally transform themselves into a service provider that delights using these technologies, there's no need for your jobs to be threatened or for your, the way of life to be threatened at all. It's simply a transformation from a bank to banking service, providing the best service possible, the number one hits. Thank you very much. have the first bullets from me. Um, efficient digital banking service providers will win in the end, as I just said. So it's, it's about delivering wonderful service to your customers at the end of the day is what this technology enables you to do. And you have to grab that by the horns and, and do it. That's what needs to be done. Um, and definitely to, to get back even on Jet's comments, uh, it, it's already happening. If you look at banks like uh, number 26 in, in Germany, they, they are already in there looking at how the user experience and uh, people less servicing can make sense for customers. And tomorrow, rich customers are those who, who, who have grown up with a mobile phone in hands. And it changes everything. Um, I'm sure everyone has seen a nephew of two years old playing with an iPad as, as if it was natural. And as they wait, they, they, they experience things and they interact. So it, it's going to change a lot and, and the services will need to change. There are plenty of possibilities. Uh, but uh, we have to remind that it's all a matter of transforming the right way. And, and, and people are key to this transformation. The current knowledge, uh, cognitive knowledge and the current knowledge of how you can make sense for a customer is still needed. It, it's part of this complex alchemy between the data and how we apply data science on top of it. An algorithm is not generating another one. It's still a human being working on it, okay? And for the question of uh, Tesla, um, it's strange to see that they, 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 have been, uh, they have been in two accidents right now with intelligent um, Artificial intelligence, but in the other way around, uh, Elon Musk is one of these first guys who, who, who put himself in front of the public and s clearly state that we need, we need as human beings to put boundaries into what we will enable a machine to do in the future. And that's, that's very important. Uh, for those of you who like science fiction, we can think about the thriller of robotics. And, and because robotics is more than just a piece of metal, it's actually the algorithm and the artificial intelligence beyond it. We, we specifically need to put boundaries. And for that, I believe Europe is good because, well, 
Every time there is an innovation, we put boundaries. So um, if it moves, regulate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it for me. Um, I remember we received questions, um, but I don't have them in mind. Ah, okay. So um, to the audience now, it's up to you to work. Uh, if you have questions, please stand up and just say your name and speak out loudly so that we can hear you here. You blasted their minds. Apparently. <laughs> yes. John. Didn't get the end. Was it data or gut feeling that made us come to Luxembourg? Yeah, what the weight of each was when you both decided to uh, develop your business in Luxembourg? I will leave the question to Jed because as a, as a border guy like a lot of you, well, it was obvious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I have a long history with Luxembourg. I came here in 1993 as a civilian officer with NATO and uh, stayed a while and uh, left for a little bit. And I came back several years later to, uh, to set up a company with two Luxembourgish partners. And um, that was in 2008. And in 2014, I started KYC3 because I was here. Kids are happy in school. So, you know, <laughs> and it's a good place to be. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. My name is Ali Kun and I work at the IT at BGL. Uh, I wanted to ask a question more on the protection side of the data. You know, the regulation, especially on banks, are very strongly regulating what we can show uh, to the people or what we can use. So uh, there are things that say, well, you can only use the data that is uh, used to proceed his or execute his operations. So in this sense, how uh, does this fit together? You have on the one side uh, the Google, Amazon, which is exploiting your data in any sense they want. On the other side, you have the regulator, which forces you in very strong uh, regulations. That's a, a legislative question more than a technical one. We can do lots with the data, but what we're allowed to do, you're right, is, is an issue. I've had several people approach me about KYC3 and say, look, you can't, you know, when I put their name in, for example, you look yourself up and you say, wow, how do you know all of that about me? Well, it's public. The data is public. And I did have a discussion with the CNPD here about that. Everything we process is, it might not be uh, surface web, it might be deep web, some of it, but it's all public data. And if it's produced by a government and published like a commercial registry, there is no limitation on how you can use that data. Um, and process it. If you're dealing with private data, of course, the foundation of all data protection is consent. You need consent from the person who you're, you're using their data about them. Um, but as we don't process private data, we don't have that issue in KYC3 today. So, and, and it is something that legislators will have to address. I think ultimately my thinking in that direction is that you should own your data trail. Um, I don't think that it's right that Facebook owns everything I put in Facebook by default. I have a basis watch. I don't think it's right that my, my pulse is owned by a company that's owned by Intel. Uh, this is going to have to be addressed. Bonjour, um, <coughs> Michael. Uh, I was just thinking about uh, how do you see the maturity of uh, the um, uh, Luxembourg market evolution? We, we talked about a lot about American companies, German banks, uh, other, other countries maybe Europe on, or, or not Europe. Uh, how do you see the, the maturity and the evolution? Do we, do we go fast? Do we are behind? Uh, are we in the medium trend? What, what is the, the next steps for machine learnings and big data in, in, in Luxembourg, according to your experience? Um, from the current experience I have with Luxembourg, I would say it's, a, it's more a matter of uh, verticals. I do believe Luxembourg is in the best position when it comes down to processing funds data. And, uh, and definitely there is a lot of potential there, a real gold mine that is, that is not currently well used. 
especially with the change in the regulation and the fact we will lose the noise related to um, uh, fees in the transaction, that might become something very important. Uh, when it comes to banks, well, obviously, uh, no Luxembourgish bank is Bank of America, so we'll never have the same amount of information to be processed. Now we are getting up to speed with very basic algorithms that can link both external information with the amount of data that a bank might have. And it gets back to the previous question somehow, is how can I enrich my data trail and my, my base set of information so I can produce valid output data? about um, uh, how to manipulate people, where is the border of uh, when are people manipulated by big data, talking about your smartwatch when everybody knows uh, you are living on a healthy way or not, uh, where are the boundaries when who is going to put uh, and deciding there is, uh, will be past a limit? I think it's an ethic question which that will often, more often come up. What do you think about this? I think you're absolutely right. I think today, you know, the, the whole concept of propaganda started in really at the beginning of the last century, um, and it was done on, through mass media and empowered through television. And today, with a smartphone in our pocket and the capacity of processing that we have, you can actually generate personalized propaganda. So propaganda to manipulate a specific individual or group of individuals. And I think that's being done. Um, I, I don't think it's regulated properly. Other questions? Hi, um, I have a question about, uh, you know, already this book was uh, written a few years ago, The Bubble Effect. Uh, how do you see the evolution of the filtering uh, through Google and Facebook of uh, what uh, people are actually looking for and actually learning and communicating with each other? It is very philosophical. Um, I, I think it's polarizing. I, I think that it's, it's forcing people into exactly that effect. And uh, by being aware of it, we have to force ourselves to break out of it. We have to seek out conflicting viewpoints. I, I actually was reading just a few days ago a study that uh, says that, that we are losing our ability to understand alternative viewpoints because people are seeking self-reinforcing information to their viewpoint so aggressively that they fail to be able to put themselves in the other side's shoes and understand the viewpoint of another group or individual. And losing this ability is obviously a, a serious problem and it's polarizing to society. So it's, it's a conscious effort has to be made to avoid that from happening. Somehow it's also related to the previous questions, and I believe it's, it's really a matter of education. Why, why as, a, as a human being, do you leave yourself being traced for a lot of information and do not question what you have in front of you? If you feel happy with Amazon's suggestion about what you should be reading, fine. If you want to extend your horizon, as a human being, you have the cognitive capability to think differently and start looking differently. Maybe the algorithm will adapt, but so far it's still in the position of the person consuming the data to be, to, to be master of what he wants to do and what he wants out of this information. The system can automate a lot of processing and can suggest a lot, but it will never be um, uh, the right information. No more questions? Well, Jonathan and Jed, thanks so much for this highly inspiring, very uh, complete, very comprehensive uh, expose. Um, you showed us the mind-boggling potential which is in there with your rice boxes and uh, your Zetas. And you also showed, and, w and that is frightening, I think, if you look at it, but then I thought it was really interesting in this debate also was to see the human dimension and as long as we can believe that we stay masters of that, uh, I think we are still 
All right. So thanks so much. Uh, let's give them a big applause. Uh, we hope to see you back for our FinTech Meets 3. Uh, in the meantime, may we invite you to join uh, Jonathan and Jed outside uh, for maybe a sandwich which is left and uh, otherwise a coffee or a drink. Thanks for attending FinTech Meets.